John Mueller, welcome to the Human Progress Podcast. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. I thought uh, I would talk to you today about your new book, The Stupidity of War, American Foreign Policy and the Case for Complacency. And uh, for those of you, our viewers and listeners who don't know John Mueller, John is, of course, a political scientist at Ohio State University. He is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So, John, um, what's the book about? Well, it's basically, a, you could say, a biography of an idea. And the idea is that war, at least international war, is really very stupid. And it took a long time for that to catch on, though there must have been individual people who thought it previously. Uh, before World War I, it was extremely common, very easy to find people, not Russian, Russian militarists, but uh, poets, uh, historians, journalists, talking about war as being beautiful, honorable, glorious, redemptive, while peace was disgusting and bo filled with bovine content and materialistic and so forth. Um, after the war, uh, that basically goes away. Uh, it, it, I found maybe two people have said that at all since World War II, but since World War I. So there's, there's a major change in attitude. And my argument is that basically over the ensuing century, that idea that international war should be gotten rid of has been fairly successful. Okay, so World War I obviously plays a very large role in uh, your narrative. So uh, how is World War I different from previous conflicts? Why is it so pivotal to, to your theory? Yeah, I can't really... What I can do is say what I just said, namely before the war, you can find hundreds of people saying how wonderful war was. And after the war, it's almost impossible. Um, and uh, so war, the war was probably important. But if you look at what, what was unique about World War I, uh, well, it was very destructive, obviously, but there are a huge number of destructive wars in the past, including ones in which were like total annihilation took place. Uh, you know, the whole country or, or city was burned to the ground and people were, everybody was killed or sold into slavery. Um, it was obviously uh, unromantic, but it, it would come as no surprise to find out that mud and leeches and uh, dysentery were not invented in 1914. Um, it was very stupid, but uh, you know, the war, the Trojan War between the Greeks and the Trojans was fought over the infidelities of a single woman. Uh, and it lasted 10 years and ended up with the total destruction of Troy. I mean, the plenty, if you want to find stupid wars, it's not difficult. Um, the thing that seems to be, and there's there's a certain amount of economic development, of course, as, as you're well aware, the European miracles starting to take place in the 19th century, uh, but it didn't seem to have any impact on war enthusiasm. Um, so it may have primed people somewhat uh, for, for a change, but it, 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 I don't think it was conclusive in any sense. But was unusual was that before World War I, there was an active anti-war movement starting about 1889. Um, and it was a growing movement. It was a gadfly movement. It was sort of ridiculed by the war supporters and so forth, but it was there. So my thinking is that uh, World War I may have been necessary because uh, it played into the hands of the peace movement. At any rate, whatever that's, whether that's true or not, at the end of the war, uh, the peace movement now suddenly became uh, universal. Everybody wanted to get rid of that kind of war, international war, not necessarily colonial war or, or tribal wars or something, but international war, meaning wars among states, particularly in Europe. Um, and uh, they set about with the League of Nations all kinds of things to try to do that. Um, the World War II came, of course. Uh, Japan was not part of this consensus, uh, and I think uh, the war in Europe probably would not have happened had Hitler uh, not uh, had Hitler been run over by a truck or poisoned by his cook or something. Uh, regardless, what do you think about that? Anyway, after World War II, they came together again, and this time uh, it is stuck. Um, so that we are now basically at, at a long, an incredibly long period, 75 years, in which there's been no wars among developed states, particularly those in Europe, Europe and the developed world, you might call it. Um, the the uh, Europe has now been free from substantial international war for the longest period of time since the word Europe was invented. Um, and I think that's very, that's, that's really very significant. Um, in addition, what has happened is that the numbers of international, obviously that, that's the developed world I've been talking about, 
Um, and it, it's basically, I know in human progress, you want to talk about progress, but what I want to talk about is the progress in the sense of some, the, the most, um, <clears throat> the most memorable uh, non-event in history, which is World War III. It never happened. Um, but there, are, there were other international wars, but most of them had clustered in the first half, like before 1975, uh, were international wars between Israel and, and the Arab states, or between India and Pakistan. And so now for the last 30 years, the international wars, um, which is amazingly small number, big, big blank, huge numbers of wars, uh, years in which there weren't any wars at all, any international wars at all. Um, those One was a war between Ethiopia and Eritrea at the end of the last century. The other two were the 9-11 wars in which the United States uh, took out the Taliban and took out the uh, took out um, uh, Saddam Hussein's regime in Iraq. Both of those wars, international wars, were very brief. Of course, then they ended up with long-term civil wars or wars of insurgency. So uh, it just seems to me that basically this has been an, an enormous change. And I think probably the bottom line on this, and this, of course, is is speculative, but I think make, you can make a good case for it, and I try to in my book at least, is that uh, international war has basically become um, not, basically doesn't happen very much at all as a way for states to solve their differences. In other words, it's become just seen as stupid. There's still plenty of problems. There's still economic sanctions. There's still intervening in civil wars. Um, there's shots across bows. There's, there's uh, uh, efforts to, uh, you know, get fishing rights. Uh, there's pushing around, there's lobbing cyber balloons uh, in various sorts. There's espionage continues as ever. But the idea of using war to settle international disputes, um, uh, differences, is, is basically become substantially obsolete, I think. It's uh, disputes between countries. Yeah. Um, the Eritrea-Ethiopia war is very interesting. Uh, I know a little bit about it just because I have a friend, Michaela Wrong, and a, a London-based mm. uh, journalist who has written extensively about Ethiopia and Eritrea. And this particular conflict may well be one of the more stupid wars over a tiny yeah. little village of Badme. And I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of people died on each side over a tiny piece of territory in the middle of a desert or something like that. So that's very strange. Mm -hmm. Um, let me yeah, ask what's you different is that that, 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 would, that used to be the standard thing. I mean, you know, that right. the of war, it's like that. Europe was the most warlike of continents uh, over, over eggshells frequently. Um, in your research, uh, did you find any interesting uh, um, nascent anti-war sentiment in Britain and in the British Empire during the Boer War. I ask that because I, uh, I spent part of my childhood in South Africa and I seem to recall reading in South African history that uh, there was a large chunk of the British population uh, in uh, 1899, 1900 that really became quite vociferously anti-imperial, anti-war, partly as a result of the surprise that the English received in South Africa at the hands of the Boers. The Boers were able to purchase sophisticated uh, military machinery from Germany, Maxim guns and so forth, and were able to inflict very heavy losses on the British uh, on the British troops. And I think this may have been the first time that the, the, the Brits have found uh, a near equal in their fight for, for territory. And as a result of the massive casualties, uh, war became slightly less sexy as early as 1900. Is, is there something to it? Yes, definitely. Uh, when I mentioned the anti-war movement, which is really fascinating and really much under-discussed, um, it was started with a novel by a, a novelist named Berta von Suttner, a noblewoman from Austria, called Lay Down Your Arms in 1889. And she had become an anti-war. She'd, you know, she'd, she'd read around and, and uh, become uh, more and more discontented with war, and that's part of the novel. Uh, but uh, then she wrote this book, and it suddenly it went viral. Uh, and she was flabbergasted. I mean, she, knows, she calls it an accident. Uh, she wrote the book, obviously, in good faith and hoping people would buy it, obviously. Uh, but she never expected this. And it really started an anti-war movement throughout, throughout, Af throughout uh, Europe and also in the United States and Canada. Um, and so you had peace societies. Uh, you had prominent industrialists joining the fray, like uh, Andrew Carnegie and uh, Alfred Nobel. 
Um, and so, and there was sort of a groundswell of, of you know, this became sort of the thing one would talk about. Uh, but it was much, much drowned out by the pro-war types who said war is inevitable. God wants people to have war. Um, you can read, the, for example, uh, let me re just read you a passage from a, uh, uh, a journal in, in 19th century uh, called 19th Century. It's sort of a intellectual, you know, Hudson Review type thing. And it's written by, a, and I came across it, it's called God's Purpose by War. It's written by Reverend Father H.I.D. Ryder. He says, war of, this is the theologian. War evokes the best qualities of human nature, giving the spirit a predominance over the flesh. So it's very common. There's a British historian in 1910 or so talking about a world at peace would be never happened. It'd be horrible. It'd be the world sunk into bovine content. Um, so it's always there. There was there's also in Britain shortly after what you're talking about uh, in the end of 1910s and uh, 1900s um, that there was a, um, uh, not a, a nonfiction book written by Norman Angel mm -hmm. um, and uh, called the, the Grand Illusion. He couldn't get a publisher for it. People said you know he, has, he went around and talked to people and they, the publishers and they said no find a Quaker publisher you know. Um, but he finally published it, and then and it went viral too. And his argument was economic. His argument was that war may or may not have been a good idea in the bad days, but in the old days. But it's lost its meaning now. Now we can trade. It's very, very, very 21st century in a lot of ways. Um, uh, you know, people would say, "Well, we have to, we have to stop the Germans because they'll, they'll take over Canada." And why? And he and they and he'd ask them, "Why do you want it? Why would they want to take over Canada?" Uh, and they said, well, they want to get the Canadian wheat. And you say, well, if they want the Canadian wheat now, what do they do? They can go to Canada and buy the wheat, right? And they said, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just, you know, so his argument was that basically you, it, um, war was futile, economically futile. And he was, he was uh, you know, he had, 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 he had also a fair amount of following. Uh, so there was this growing movement. It was attracting fairly prominent people, business people. Um, some politicians and so forth, but it was still basically derided. Um, and, and Angel's argument was uh, said, you know, what are you talking about? We don't fight wars for booty. We fight wars for a grand, glorious honor, et cetera, you know, whatever. Uh, it's disgusting to even talk about booty. Um, and um, there was also uh, an idea that this is a woman's movement, uh, that, that women, uh, the women are very prominent, like Berta von Zutner, who eventually won the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, in about in shortly after 1900, um, and uh, that men who joined it were uh, ants, you know, nearly ants of both old elderly ants of both sexes are in this. Men, in other words, you, you didn't, you didn't, you last, you lacked masculinity. So uh, the movement was definitely there, and you're quite right. Uh, there are various things that, that triggered it. There are a fair number of economists um, and. Uh, 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 other intellectuals uh, uh, joining the fray at various points, but it's still very, so, so what you couldn't do is escape the argument. The argument is out there. You could ridicule it and they ridicule it big time. Mm. But what happened so, was after the war it changed. Okay, so essentially your argument could be, uh, it's analogous to what happens in late 18th century with the Declaration of Independence and assertion that all men are created equal. Once the idea is born, it starts mushrooming, it starts expanding, and ultimately it triumphs, right? And the analogous argument that you are making would be that once the idea of war is stupid, peace is better, is born, then it creates its own momentum in a way. Yeah, it did, but there, but you know, wars have always been stupid. <laughs> but right, but why somebody the had... Greece, when, when the Greece and the Trojans say, "Boy, that was really stupid." Uh, why did they do it after the Napoleonic Wars or after the or the Thirty Years' War? Um, the, the, it just I, I spend a lot of my career trying to figure out why ideas change, and it's really hard. Um, you know, um, in, in Shakespeare's day, they would close the they would close the um, theaters because they they correctly thought that human contact somehow was invisibly spreading the disease. But why didn't somebody say that could be the same in water? It took three centuries before someone, you know, looked at the drinking water and the huge improvements of health that took place at the end of the 19th century came from that. But why didn't it happen earlier? Uh, 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 all men are created equal. Why didn't somebody talk about that 200, 200 2000 years earlier? 
Uh, they knew what democracy was. You know, Greeks had it. Um, so it was not a new idea, uh, but it was still known when the Americans did it as the American experiment to show that democracy can work. The other arguments I've come across for the decline in international conflicts uh, would be things like we are so rich now, at least in the Western developed world, that uh, war has become unthinkable because the losses to the material standard of living that we have become accustomed to would be so great that, you know, it's uh, we, we best not go down that route. And another argument that I have encountered is that since in the developed world so few babies are being born, I mean, Korea right now, the total fertility rate per woman is one, in Central and Eastern Europe, it's like 1.3, 1.2, that, that children have now become so precious that we don't want to uh, expose them to the horrors of war. Do, do any of these two arguments uh, jive with you or, or not really? Yeah, not, not very much. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, you know, decline in, in, in uh, the reduction in women having children is a fairly recent thing. And the opposition to war goes back a century before the fight. Uh, and it was uh, over the you know, over a short period of time that suddenly people said, let's not do that anymore. So I don't think it was that, that they valued human life that much more. And the economic thing is really tricky because when you get bigger economies, they can tolerate wars better. I, see. I mean, there's a, study, there's a study, for example, of a city during the 30 years war uh, in, in Prussia, Germany, um, and uh, it's an economic study to see. It took 100 years for that city to get back to where it was before the 30 years war. Uh, after World War I, Germany was back in action, best back, back to 1913 standards by about 1920, 28, about 10 years. And after World War II, Germany, and this time the war was, of course, fought on German turf, was pretty much back to 1938 standards by 1948, 49, 50. Um, so, the, so the recovery, the recovery is actually very fast economically. It's not That's that true. it's not that we have more to lose. We do have more to lose, but we also are incredibly good at, because of the strength of modern economies. We're able to recover very quickly, as we may see now with COVID fading away. Okay, so we have this change, um, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, you are really talking about cultural, psych psychological, and ethical changes. You are not talking about human nature uh, changing right. and becoming more peaceful. So, right. did we did we get it wrong all along that humans are by nature violent and conflictual? You know, when Hobbes talks about life being short, brutish, and whatever. Um, <laughs> um, uh, nasty, don't forget oh, nasty. <laughs> yeah, nasty, <laughs> nasty, brutish, and short. Um, hmm. So. You know, obviously, genes change at a much slower pace than culture, than uh, than ethics. Um, so we are working essentially with the same human, but now, for whatever reason, uh, well, you explain in your book, uh, that human is able to submerge that natural impulse towards towards violence. Um, but that could also flip, right? Yeah, well, it's a, uh, a, a, a the way I put it is war is natural, but it's not necessary. I mean, sex is necessary, eating is necessary, defecating is necessary, but but uh, war is not. Um, it's interesting that you can do war. You can actually get people to go into uh, these disastrous situations and waving flags and dying for their buddies. Um, and uh, actually, really interesting. I, I'm very interested in. Once I work up my courage, I may try to write an article about Shakespeare and war, because I think he really was an anti-war type. Uh, and in his most pro-war uh, play is Henry V. And as Henry V is going into battle, he prays to God to take away the reason from his soldiers. In other words, if they have reason, they'll realize this is really stupid. I shouldn't be doing this. They'd be running the opposite direction. And that's really quite profound. And so essentially what you can do is you can actually mass people so they get killed, as we saw in World War One or in the American Civil War or many other wars, by the hundreds of thousands, um, and they still, you know, keep going. But it's not necessary. You don't need it. If you want to use an analogy with dueling, because people would say that about dueling, well, young men in a certain social set or have testosterone and all that kind of stuff, uh, and uh, one they have to take it out by 
fighting duels from time to time. Um, well, dueling has died out. Young men, I don't think, have changed their human nature. Uh, they're as, as self-centered and you know belligerent as they ever were, but they don't duel anymore. It never occurs to them, in fact, to fight a duel to solve a you know you might hit the guy in the face, uh, you might uh, uh, talk behind his back and so forth. You might sue him if if it's a libel type thing or something, but and you're, you still are get ticked off when your honor is besmirched, when you're disrespected. But men of that social class don't even think about it anymore. So it's hard to imagine the genes would change. Also, the change was very brief, quick, like four years, you know, from 1914 to 1920. Uh, you can't have a lot of gene change over that period of time. It seems. No, you cannot. Okay, so upshot is that humanity can be socialized into being more peaceful um, uh, in in a in a relatively short period of time. And but but the opposite is also true that if you do have a militarist fanatic somewhere, uh, right. he can brainwash his people into uh, into more like warlike disposition, right? Um, right. Which brings us, of course, to Hitler. Yeah, they, 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 what we haven't lost is the ability to do wars, right? Right, no, right. I can't do them right. Right. So that brings us really to Hitler and to uh, ir and, and, and to irrational leaders. I'm not, you know, Hitler may have been rational in his own particular way, but there are plenty of irrational leaders out there. Um, uh, how do you deal with the problem of Hitler um, and and the and Second World War, that's question number one. And question number two, how do you deal with irrational individuals at the heads of government? Yeah, I don't, I don't see Hitler as being, being particularly irrational. I mean, he knew what he wanted. Uh, he correctly doped out that he could fight for a while, at least. He could fight blitzkriegs. He invented the idea of blitzkrieg. Fighting quick, uh, successful wars, it would minimize casualties, basically, and be successful. And he was successful until finally the Soviet invasion. Uh, and his uh, attack on France in 1940 was an astounding success. Astounding. You know, I guess, you know, it sounds like sacrilege or something, but if you go around, it was the most successful military venture in all of human history. That might be, you know, be in the top list, I think. And that was Hitler doing it. Um, so, um, uh, but what I can't find is there's anybody else with that opinion. For example, John Keegan, I can give you 20 historians who basically say this, but John Keegan, the great military historian, says that in, in, in the 1930s or after World War I, there was no European except Hitler who wanted another war. Um, and uh, I think that's basically true, because I looked, I tried to find somebody on a soapbox saying, let's do another war and so forth. Hitler didn't talk about, he, 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 uh, every single foreign policy speech he made was how much he hated war. Um, and uh, I got, in fact, I got a website in which I've taken all the passages from every, it's like two or three page, two or three sentences in every foreign policy speech, which he says, I, I, I hate war. And he, he would have convinced me that he hated war because he uses racial theory to justify it. So in, that, in other words, he said, look at me, I'm a racist. Why would I want to take over Poland? I have a bunch of Poles. And I, you know, a lot of best Germans would be killed in the process. And then I'd have this thing, the cesspool of Poles. Why would I want to do that? Now, the French could do that because they're misogynistic. You know, they even let Africans into Paris. But not me. I'm a racist. Um, so my racial theory, and, and of course, that, that, was, that was the biggest lie, obviously. Um, but um, basically, uh, there's, there's several, there, there's two books in particular dealing with German public opinion. They both conclude that there was no drive for war. There was nobody else uh, around. Uh, that shared his view, except possibly a few top sycophants, and none of them have much leadership ability, nor did the people in the military. Um, so that's why, basically, the question is, you know, you keep seeing things like, it, it is questionable that anybody could have led Germany to war except Adolf Hitler. And he, he was in a bad automobile crash in 1930, and he almost got killed. He almost, and the guy in the in beer hall putsch uh, in the 1920s, the guy next to him was killed by a police bullet, but not him. So it, just a minor change like that um, could have could have could have made a huge difference. So he was, he was really essential. It, you know, it's a great tragedy of all time, obviously. Mm -hmm. So he's a he's he's a rational leader. Do we do you have any uh, do you have any idea about or can you can you identify 
irrational leaders that cannot be reasoned with in the last half a century, for example, and what our response to them should be? Um, no, it's really hard. I don't find it a very helpful concept, basically. Mm -hmm. it, irrational, but sort of, it sort of means crazy or something. They make mistakes, big mistakes. Anybody who starts a war and then loses it obviously made a mistake, uh, assuming you wanted to win the war. Uh, but they, they're fairly well calculating. Um, they may be, but they may, you know, I think, you know, I was totally opposed to the Iraq war that the United States went into uh, in print. Um, and uh, basically, I could see that the reasons justifying it were crazy. They were dupe, we're, we're not, not crazy, but basically highly dubious, like he was going to somehow, with a screwball army, uh, dominate the Middle East. I mean, how, you know, they, they, basically the argument was we can easily take Saddam Hussein out because he has such a rotten army. If we don't take him out with that same rotten army, he's going to dominate the Middle East. Come on. <laughs> the, after, the, after the fighting in Kuwait, the, the, arm, the Iraqi army mainly showed how uh, impressive it could, at, could be at doing bug outs. And that was the same case also when the United States invaded in 2003. So the idea that he could dominate the Middle East was, was, was loopy, it seems to me. But I don't think it was irrational. You know, the reason, you know, I talked to yeah. a lot of people at that time who said, no, he, you know, he can't, he's going to be, you just can't trust him. He's going to, you know, do something daffy. And I, I keep coming back as, as other people have saying, no, he was quite rational in many cases. For example, he invaded Iran um, in, uh, in the early 80s and then realized it was a bad idea and he tried to get out of the war. Tried to do it, but the Khomeini the other, on the other side wouldn't, wouldn't agree. So as far as I can see, he's, he's a reasoning individual. That doesn't mean the reasoning is sound, however. Yeah, one could, one could almost go as far as saying is that people who maintain themselves at the head of these dictatorial governments with all the things that could go wrong around them have to have a very attuned sense of cost benefits of their actions if the ultimate goal is self-preservation. Yeah. It's a very tricky business, and, but it's certainly, surely going to be their main motivation, including Tom's. Now, so in, in, uh, in your book, you advise, <laughs> you advise two specific courses of action. Uh, one is complacency and the one is appeasement. So let's, uh, we'll, we'll leave appeasement for a second. Um, I was born in Czechoslovakia, nice. so I'm going to tease you with that one later. But let's start with complacency. And you had a wonderful quote from Calvin Coolidge, one of my favorite presidents. What's complacency all about? And how does it fit in American foreign policy? Uh, well, he was sort of the guru of complacency in some respect, because he said, but I think it's basically true. If you see 10 problems coming down the road at you, the chances are nine of them are going to the ditch before they ever get to you. And it seems to me that um, if, we, if, we had been, uh, if we had been complacent about terrorism, what we would have done was go after it in a much more, after 9-11, after complacency would not have been appropriate totally after 9-11, but going at it with a warlike stance, trying to take out the Taliban and so forth, was not the way to do it. It could have been done with the uh, support of the Taliban, probably, and also the support of Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, who are very much on the American side. Um, so um, it, it, that complacency would have been there. In the case of Saddam Hussein, complacency would have obviously been much better than this disastrous war that has ensued, the, 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 uh, the, the initial war, and then, of course, this long war of occupancy. Um, the number of people who have died because of the American intervention in Iraq is now more than 100 times higher than the number who died on 9-11. Um, and that should be kept in mind. It's just been, you know, a, a uh, much better would have been complacency. Another way of putting it is if the United States had been complacent, they would have, wouldn't have gone in Vietnam and another 2 million people wouldn't have died. If it had been complacent then after 9-11, uh, it would have used different methods, much milder methods, try to take, go after Al-Qaeda. And uh, those, all those people wouldn't have died. And the country would not have been destroyed through the occupation. And the same with, uh, in the case of Iraq, they wouldn't have done it at all. Um, so, um, and I'm, I've also applied basically uh, more, uh, this section, of course, current threats. And one of the arguments that goes through the book repeatedly is that um, we've exaggerated threat. We exaggerated how big the Soviets were as a military threat during the Cold War. We exaggerated Al Qaeda massively after it, after 9/11, and I think we're doing it again. With, for example, with both Russia and China, they they do present problems. 
they are something we have to worry about in some respects, but they don't uh, uh, suggest a security threat. If they lob cyber balloons, uh, if they steal information, um, if they uh, sort of throw their weight around, um, it's not really war. It's, it is, and it may be a pain in the neck, and you may want to not deal with them, but they don't represent a strategic military threat, it seems to me. So that, that uh, another place where complacency would make some sense is in terms of um, uh, uh, worrying about nuclear proliferation. Since, since 1945, no one has been killed by a nuclear weapon, but hundreds of thousands of people have been killed by war and sanctions efforts to try to prevent nuclear proliferation, particularly in Iraq, North Korea, Iran. Um, and so complacency in that case would have been much better uh, because they haven't done anything with the weapons. It doesn't really matter that much whether they get these stupid things anyway. Uh, and it's certainly better to deal with them in different ways than starting wars or economic sanctions, which uh, kill large numbers of people. More people have died from economic sanctions than died from Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined. Uh, one argument that I'm sure you have encountered many, many times is that this is all 2020 hindsight, but in reality, when you were right in the middle of the Cold War, facing the Soviet divisions and tens of thousands of uh, nuclear weapons, uh, that the American response was just right to counter the Soviet threat with our own American militarization. Um, tell me about the historical research on the intentions of, of the Soviets. What do the archives show that the Soviets really intended to do? Because as a, as a child of the Cold War, um, I obviously uh, remember these things very well. And I think that in Eastern Europe, certainly a lot of people are still grateful to the Americans and militarization under Reagan for uh, really, quote unquote, winning the Cold War. Um, but if the Soviets were really contained and they didn't have any aggressive intentions, then, uh, then the US militarization and spending of so much money and interventions in Korea and Vietnam get a different gloss. So what's your reading on the, on the Soviets and their intentions? Yeah, the, the intentions were based, they, they, they intended to take over the world. <laughs> Uh, they said it a million times, and every, you know, every propaganda, every bumper sticker and so forth. And they were going to use violence if necessary, uh, uh, class warfare or civil war or subversion or something. But they were not going to use direct war. Uh, there's tons of evidence that they never considered seriously a war in Europe, much less a war against the United States, much less, of course, a starting a, a nuclear war. Um, and uh, my concern during the Cold War is that very few people saw that. Now, what you say basically is we have to, particularly after the Korean War, we have to be really worried that they're going to start a war. Okay, well, that's one hypothesis is that they really want to take over the war by, world by military force. But you could also say that, come on, get off it. This is a, this is a limited probe in a far off area in Korea, and it doesn't pretend anything in terms of direct military aggression. Uh, and very few people said that, almost nobody. In fact, I got a quote in the book from John Gaddis who said um, in 1950, talking about the foreign policy establishment, nobody, nobody could imagine that we'd go uh, for decades without a, a major war, including ones with nuclear weapons. And it's on page 403. <laughs> and I wrote Gaddis saying, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the subject line, it's page 403. Um, and I said, you know, do you really, is that really, you really believe that? He said, yeah, I mean, nobody, nobody? And um, he said, no, there's nobody saying that. Uh, that. In other words, there's nobody saying the proposition to prove to be true. Now, that doesn't mean it was true, but it fit the evidence. You can say, well, the Soviet Union was uh, 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 devastated by World War II. Um, they've, uh, they've uh, got a plan to take over the world, but it doesn't involve direct military aggression. Um, and uh, they fought on, you know, they fought to try to prevent World War II uh, with Hitler. They were attacked by Hitler. They didn't attack the West. Um, you could make that, that, not, that doesn't mean it's necessarily true that they're still that way. You want to consider the opposition, but that argument was never there. And I, I have the one, there's a couple of people, maybe George Cannon, probably Bernard Brody among intellectuals, defense intellectuals and foreign policy intellectuals, but also interestingly, 
um, Dwight Eisenhower. And I go into this in a fair amount of depth, and I've looked into it pretty carefully. And he really believed what I just said, namely that we have to worry about them because of a sort of peaceful infiltration, as he put it, but they're not going to start wars. Um, and the, he was apparently traumatized big time, or, or you know, uh, the sky burst open for him. Right after the war, he had been commander in chief of the American, for the, the, the Allied forces in Europe. And once Hitler was defeated, he flew to Moscow to meet with Moscow, to meet with Stalin. And then flying back, he was flying, either they're flying very low or there are no clouds or something. He could look down and everything was destroyed from Moscow all the way to, I guess, Berlin, where he's flying back to. He said, these people aren't going to start another war. You know, and, and then he talked to them and they'd say, look, my son was killed in the war. Everybody's son was killed in the war, except in families where the whole family was destroyed in that war. We're not going to do that again with or without nuclear weapons. But Eisenhower was unwilling really to say that in public. So that as he's leaving office, he talks about we've got we're spending much too much money on on nuclear weapons in particular, but on defense overall. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and he blamed it on the military industrial complex. But what he didn't do was attack the premise for the military industrial complex. The reason it was so successful was people thought the Ruskies are coming over the border anytime now and taking over and starting World War III. Uh, and he didn't believe that, but he, he never basically said it really in public overall. So my argument is not that they should not have been thinking about this and Dean's trying to deter, but they should have been looking at like, this other hypothesis that they didn't have to reter, uh, deter. And that hypothesis is not on the table. Um, and um, the, the the archives now show, and that's what they said. They never said, they always said, we're not going to attack. We, we can defend ourselves if you attack us, but not the other way around. And the archives show this, this to be very much the case. That, that, that was true, basically. So the problem is that the proposition that proved to be true was not accepted by anybody. No one was really advocating it. And the proposition was false. If you want to use an analogy, it would be with word 9-11. After 9-11, the same thing. You go through discussions with the, the uh, um, uh, intelligence people. And they said, after 9-11, we were sure, we were certain, certain, certain that there was going to be another attack and it would be even bigger than the one in 9-11. And we talk, see us in the, wall, hall, in the hallway and say, is this going to be the day? And so forth. And of course, never happened. No one is saying, no, that was hardly anybody was saying. I was saying. <laughs> it happened I gave an interview to the Columbus Dispatch about the 12th of, of, of uh, September um, and uh, said, well, you know, we shouldn't be overestimating we, these guys because they happened to get lucky with a couple of horrible pot shots. Uh, and two or three other people, also academics at, at Ohio State, said the same thing, Marla. So it's possible to come to that conclusion. Uh, that doesn't mean it's right. I didn't say it was right. I just said, you know, we have to think about that. Uh, and it proved to be the hypothesis is correct. But at the top levels, it was completely not there. Let's move <laughs> on, to, on to the easy subject of appeasement. <laughs> um, in, uh, in, in your book, um, you say it's a perfectly legitimate way of conducting international relations. Um, what do you mean by that? A Czechoslovak freaks out immediately. <laughs> yeah. right, well, the, Czech, the problem was that Hitler was unappeasable in 1938. It didn't matter what the, what the British and French did. The in, fact, I believe, in fact, I believe that Western powers, uh, Britain specifically, realized that Hitler was unappeasable after he... Uh, after he consumed the rump Czech state yeah, right. in uh, 1934, I believe. Right. 1930, sorry, 1939. 1939, right. 1939, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, he, his, his basic uh, statement at the time of the Czech uh, uh, appeasement issue with Munich was, we want no Czechs. That fits in what I was saying before. Well, you want to have the Czechs, they're a bunch of Slavs. I don't, you know, I don't, you know, you know what I think about Slavs. <coughs> And so, um, and then, of course, when he took over the Red, the Rump Czech Republic uh, and turned Slovakia, of course, into a puppet state and so forth, uh, he, he showed that that showed he was lying about that. And so that's when they, they said, this is it. You can't, if you do Poland, we're going to declare war on you. And that's what they did. Um, so he is unappeasable. The argument of appeasement was that he was not planning to essentially attack, but he, he won so handily in 1938 that, that encouraged him to do the attack on Poland. 
And I think that's simply not true. And I've got uh, two or three historians, uh, five or six historians, that say that very strongly. He was saying that he, they use the word unappeasable. Now, what appeasement basically means is if you go into a store um, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and you start bargaining with the dealer, uh, you come to some sort of agreement. I mean, you give in, you appease them. Okay, I'll give you more money than I think I really want to. I'd rather you give me the product free. Uh, and he says, well, I can't quite afford that. Can we work out a, you know. So appeasement and, and that kind of bargaining is is extremely common. We use it all the time. Um, uh, currently, in terms of international relations, it seems to me that two of the things that both China, the, the things that both China and Russia want is to sort of get past what they call humiliations. And they say it all the time. The Chinese think there's a century of humiliation going back to the Opium War. We're a big country now. We want to be taken seriously. And it seems to me that's just fine. We should take them seriously. Uh, and the Russians say the same thing because they talk about humiliated because of the end of the Cold War and the split up the Soviet Union, uh, which, by the way, was not caused by anything the Americans did. The overspending was done because of the stupid policies of the Soviet Union and the Brezhnev, I think. Uh, but basically, um, we should appease them. You know, we should say, well, let's let's work things out and and bring them in to councils. For example, on Syria now, uh, the United States should be working. It seems to me with the Russians to try. The Syria is over. It's Assad won. That's not the best outcome I can possibly imagine, but that's the case. And this outcome is better than continuation of that horrible, dis disastrous civil war. And so now something has to be done with Assad. Something has to be done with Syria. And it seems to be both the United States and Russia, who are in the right position to do it, should be working together to, to basically make Syria back into the plain old fashioned, boring thing it used to be before, which is what people want to do. And on Afghanistan, um, the I think bringing in the Chinese, bringing in the Russians, bringing in the Iranians uh, to deal with the Pakistan, it may not work, but it would seem to be a sensible thing. No, everybody wants a nice old fashioned, boring, Afghanistan. Uh, they don't want it to be a hotbed of Islamic extremism. Uh, the Russians are very concerned about that. The Chinese are very concerned about that with their Xinjiang thing is basically based on that. They're they concerned about terrorism from there. Uh, the Pakistanis would like to have a stable thing there. If you can bring in the Indians and the Pakistanis both, that would be really interesting. Probably can't do that. But we're not even doing that. It just seems that that would be appeasement in a good sense. Let's, let's talk this over. Maybe you can help us out. Maybe it won't work. But it would it would give them sort of stature and feeling good about themselves and maybe they could be helpful. Most. One of the most striking things in your book I read was uh, the, the, the notion of territorial integrity as a standard in international relations, mm -hmm. which I totally buy, is the, the inviolability of borders. That's what we got used to in Europe after the... After the um, uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall and that sort of thing. And I really thought that that's where we were. Then Crimea happens. And that really breaks that, that standard. How do we deal with a problem of a country that goes beyond that standard, breaks that standard? How, how do we resolve Crimea in a way that, that preserves the standard and at the same time satisfies the Russians, um, the Russian pride. Yeah, basically my complacency standard says that uh, I give up. It's hopeless. Um, it's a one-off. I mean, the fear of 19, uh, 2014 was that they're going to then do the same thing in Lithuania and Estonia and so forth. In place there were substantial Russian minorities. And they, you know, no one talks about that anymore. It was a bizarre one-off, had to do with the Black Sea Fleet, had to do with the disintegration of, Yugoslav of, uh, of Ukraine generally over the election. And it just seems to me that um, it's over and we should recognize their accession. And there was a vote, uh, which seems to have been more or less correct, except a lot of people boycotted it. And a lot of Crimeans, given the, the instability in Ukraine, in which they saw fanatics who seem to be anti-Russian fanatics potentially taking over, is what the Russians say, but a lot of people believe that. Um, the, uh, Crimea basically left, voted to leave. And we should treat basically Crimea the same way the United States, the Chinese and the Russians treat Kosovo, which was not with a vote, uh, in which secession in that sense was, you know, instituted. 
uh, and uh, created by NATO and uh, without any kind of vote. Um, um, so, so essentially, it's a done deal. As one person has put it, Crimea will go back to, U uh, to Ukraine about the same time Texas goes back to Mexico. Um, it's over. And uh, should work with Russia, get a non-aggression deal from Putin, which I think, you know, he has no intent of further aggression. Um, uh, work to try to get Ukraine so that uh, instead of being, it's now the poorest country, has been the poorest country in Europe, which is outrageous because it had everything going for it. You know, the advanced uh, culture, you know, a lot of well-educated people, some of the best farmland in the universe. Um, and it's basically now the poorest country in Europe capital uh, to try to get its act together, get rid of the corruption and so forth, which the current president seems to be actually doing something about. So it seems to be a tough love for Ukraine. Uh, try to work out a deal on Donbass, which I think Putin has actually said, well, we could have like uh, United Nations forces between the two sides or something like that, uh, but still keep this juridical um, uh, uh, control in, in, in Kiev. Um, and I think that would probably work. Um, but basically, we lost. Uh, actually, everybody lost. There's a book called that about the Ukraine. Everybody lost. The Ukrainians lost, the Russians lost, the West Europeans lost, and the United States lost. It was a bad thing, probably a very unwise thing for Putin to do. Also relax sanctions, which are not doing any good on that. So my proposal is sort of unorthodox, but I think sound. <laughs> it's not, so, it not sell well in Washington. No, no, it doesn't. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a uh, sad thing. I mean, I'd be I'd be much more comfortable with what happened in Crimea if the referendum could be rerun by, uh, say, the Norwegians or somebody like that, rather than rather than Putin. Um, yes. One alternative solution is that you know, if the Chinese can work, uh, you know, in terms of centuries, decades, and centuries then perhaps having a long-term view, maybe sometime in the future, Russia will be in even more dire economic straits. And if Ukraine manages to produce a, uh, a prosperous and democratic society, maybe at some point in the future, Crimea can come back to them under different conditions. But I'm, I'm, I'm certainly very worried about uh, the sort of thing that Putin did in, in Crimea. Um, in, in the last part of our talk, I would like to turn to two very interesting takes you had on the interaction between peace and economic development and peace and democracy. So we talked a lot about foreign policy. Now I want to bring it back to human <laughs> progress. And um, and you you say, what do you say about peace and economic development? Um, it's facilitating. Um, so if you if you don't, if you have international, we're talking about international peace, of course, obviously civil wars are not exactly helpful either. But in, if, you, if, you're, if, if you're in France and in Germany and you think the other, you're going to go to war with that other country and then sometime in the next 20 years, well, you, 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 know, you don't really invest a whole lot in the other side. Um, but if basically you think it's going to be peaceful like this forever, uh, you might go over there and see if they can see you can sell something or buy something. Um, and so consequently, it's facilitating international uh, um, trade. Um, Assuming people believe in trade. I mean, if obviously everybody's an autarch <coughs> or a mercantilist, uh, then you can have peace, but no one, you know, they, they, for other reasons, like what they think is the economic reasons, they want trade. May I, inter so, may I interrupt you for one second? Sure. Um, so, uh, are you actually reversing in your thinking the relationship between economic development and peace? Because, you know, I, I've read many people say that it is when countries become rich, in other words, when they economically develop, that they become more peaceful. But what you're really saying is that peace establishes the preconditions for economic development. Peace leads to economic development. You reverse it, correct? Right. Yeah, peace, peace the desire for peace is the causative independent variable. Uh, for example, no one would say reason people are averse to being killed by on, on, uh, oncoming traffic is because they're forced to drive on the right side of the street. <coughs> Instead, what you'd say is the reason they're forced to drive on the right-hand side of the street, and they agree to do so, is because they don't want to be killed by oncoming traffic. If you have peace, then trade becomes facilitated, and maybe democracy development does too. 
you don't necessarily need a strong man to protect you from an outsider. So <coughs> let me give you an example. I the most famous example would be the coal and steel community um, set up by you know a Frenchman with a German name, a Schumann, in 1950. Now he said in that the reason for the coal and steel community to sort of try to combine the, the economies of France and Germany, uh, which of course eventually led to the whole uh, European Union and the common market, um, is because we don't want to go to war again. And if we, if we integrate our economies, we won't go to war against each other. So some people say, and I give the examples, that those kinds of agreements are the reason Germany and France have not gone to war again after World War II. Well, what I'd ask them is to find me, you know, the French, Fran France, uh, there's a lot of very clever people in France, there's a lot of really clever people in Germany. And for centuries, they use their cleverness to figure out how to get into wars with each other. And they succeeded brilliantly in these, these war, war after war after war. Now, can you find anybody in either place standing on a soapbox saying, you know, we used to have a lot of wars here between France and Germany. That was really wonderful. Let's do it again. <laughs> anyway, a politician, a guy a, a drunk on, the, on, on, a, on a park bench, anybody in France or Germany saying, let's, let's do that war again. So the idea that they have not gone to war because they have a coal and steel community or more trade strikes me as being as a backwards. Now, they, they wouldn't go to war if they did have trade, more trade, and they wouldn't go to war if they didn't have trade. They didn't go, don't go to war because they don't want to go to war. And that's the very much a positive uh, development overall. Mm -hmm. And you make if, a if you're, in favor, if you're in favor of peace, by the way. If you think peace is bad, of course, it's a bad development. And then you make, peace, you make a similar point about the uh, relationship between uh, peace and democracy. Uh, for the longest time, I heard people say, that if more countries are democratic, then you are going to end up in a, with a more peaceful world. Whereas what you are saying really is that if you have a lot of peace in the world, democracies will mushroom, correct? Uh, well, it'll, it'll be facilitating. Uh, there facilitating. Are, you have to be able to do it. Yes. I don't see, I've never subscribed to the democratic peace theory that uh, democracies, what, what, what happened is that democracy grew in the same areas that anti-war movement, anti-war sentiment grew, uh, and also liberal economic thinking grew. You know, it started basically, you know, in Manchester, England, and sort of spread to the rest of the world. Um, so they're correlated. Uh, the idea that war is a bad idea is correlated in time with the idea that economic freedom is a good thing, and that international trade is a good thing, that democracy is a good thing. But I don't think it's necessarily causative. You keep, keep having, you know, cases that don't have any of the prerequisites. For example, after 1975, uh, quite surprisingly in many respects, almost all of Latin America became democratic. And one of the cases I'd like to point to is Paraguay. Now, Paraguay had never had democracy. It had always been a Jesuit theocracy or a military dictatorship. And so there's a, the, the president was out of town, out of the country, and the vice then took over. And he said, you know, democracy is what everybody's wearing this year. So don't come back. <laughs> and the president didn't. And, and then he went to an election and said, OK, vote for me and I'll make this into a democracy like all the other, you know, like Chile and Argentina and, and uh, other countries around here, Costa Rica. And they said, OK, do it. And they did it. And it's remained, you know, it's had rocky moments, but it's remained that way ever since. It didn't have any prerequisites. It didn't, it didn't, wasn't democratic before. It just said, you know, democracy is what people are wearing. And uh, we should, um, we should be in that game. And they have been. This is absolutely fascinating. I mean, I think that people who buy your book, and once again, the book is The Stupidity of War by John Mueller. I think that even people who disagree with you on some things, um, will find this this novel take on the correlation between economic development and peace and democracy and peace uh, in itself a, a very important novel contribution to the discussions in the international relations discipline. Well, I certainly hope so. <laughs>
So with that, uh, I want to thank you very much for spending time with me today. Um, and uh, hopefully I will see you at Cato at some point in the near future. Thanks for the questions. Thanks for the interview and thanks for the time. <laughs>